Hi boys and girls, I'm here to talk to you today about sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections. And yes, I am recording this at home. So if my dogs start barking, I actually started recording this earlier and my two dachshunds started going nuts and I'm starting it over because they pretty much ruined the whole video. So um, sexually transmitted diseases. So there are several different kinds and we'll, I'll give you kind of an overview of the most common ones you're likely to encounter with your future patients. And uh, traditionally these have been referred to as STDs. Uh, there seems to be a change in terminology that's um, occurring and they're now going to be referred to as STI, sexually transmitted infections. And I think that gets into some of the nuances and terminology. Um, if you have a disease, that means that you have symptoms, you're being harmed by uh, the microbe that's present inside or on your body. You can be infected though without having symptoms. The microbe can be on or inside you and you're certainly capable of transmitting that microbe to others, but you don't really have a disease unless you have symptoms and are actually being damaged. So I think because of those little nuances and terminology, we're going to see STDs more often referred to as STIs now as we move into the future. Um, okay, so what are the most common STDs in the United States? Uh, I've got some data here from the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, which gives us some numbers on some of, some of the more common STDs in the United States. And some of these are call, caused by viruses, and some of these are caused by bacteria. And then one of these on the list is actually caused by a protozoan. And a protozoan is a single-celled organism um, whose cells are uh, structured and operated, operate much more like human cells than, say, the cells of bacteria. Okay, so let's check out our list here. I'm going to uh, talk to you today about herpes simplex virus type 2 or HSV type 2, which causes genital herpes. And this is a pretty scary statistic. About 16.2% of the U.S. population sexually active um, adults are infected with herpes simplex virus type 2. That's a pretty staggering number. And when you get into some populations, some communities, uh, this number can be even higher, as high as in the 40% range in some communities. So you got to be careful with HSV type 2. And the problem is once you have it, you got it. It's not going away. Uh, human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, which uh, causes the disease AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Uh, it's believed about 1.2 million people in the United States are infected with HIV and about 20 percent of them don't know that they're infected. Um, chlamydia is a bacterial infection and every year about 1.2 million people develop chlamydia infections. A pretty significant percentage of young people are infected with chlamydia bacteria at any given time, so you got to be careful. Um, same story with gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is also a bacterial infection with about 300,000 cases being diagnosed in the United States each year. Human papillomavirus, HPV, causes genital warts, and each year there are about 6 million cases of HPV each year in the United States. That's a pretty high number. And uh, about 20 million of those are ongoing. That's because once you have this virus, you may not get rid of it. Uh, sometimes, yes, your immune system wipes it out and it goes away, but in, in, um, in other people, the virus remains and, and you don't really clear the infection. Here's uh, the protozoan I was talking about, uh, trichomonas, which causes trichomoniasis, more commonly known as the sexually transmitted infection trick really high numbers, about 7.4 million people in the United States develop trichomoniasis each year. And syphilis, this is a pretty uh, well-known sexually transmitted infection in the United States, and we don't have nearly as many numbers of uh, cases of syphilis diagnosed each year, about 14,000. Um, but certainly it's still one you guys should be aware about, aware of. Okay, let's talk about good old herpes simplex virus type 2. This is a virus, 
and it causes genital herpes. And the reason for that is because it uh, infects cells in your skin and on the mucous membranes of the reproductive organs. And this can lead to lesions, which are fluid-filled blisters uh, that are very painful. And those can actually occur on the genitals themselves, in the perineum, um, actually along the skin of the thigh, around the genital area, um, and also on the, on the buttocks as well. So this virus actually, viruses go inside your cells to multiply, to replicate themselves. They basically turn your cells into little factories that make new viruses. And so that's what's happening on your skin or along the mucous membrane linings of these reproductive organs when you have a herpes virus outbreak. When you see the blisters, that's uh, an indication that your immune system has come in to attack the virus and attack those cells. Um, now, sometimes when you first get infected, it may be asymptomatic, so you may not have these types of lesions when you first become infected. Um, the nasty thing about herpes simplex virus type 2 is that once you have become infected, let's look at this diagram down here, uh, the virus is inside these skin cells or cells along a mucous membrane lining of the reproductive tract. And um, so you have the blisters, the outbreak going on. And some of those viruses actually go inside the axons of sensory neurons that supply those tissues. Remember your sensory neurons from Biology 201? Uh, they travel up those axons and then they basically go dormant or latent. This is called a latent state inside the cell bodies of the sensory neurons. So they're back up there near your spinal cord. Remember the do dorsal root sensory ganglia? near your spinal cord where the cell bodies of those sensory neurons are located. That's where these herpes viruses are hanging out. Um, and they basically just go dormant, they go quiet, um, and then every once in a while they become reactivated and they start multiplying again, they start replicating, and then those new viruses travel down the axons of those sensory neurons. Um, they emerge and then they reinfect cells of the skin and those mucous membrane linings and you wind up with another outbreak like you see here on the slide. Um, now in some people those are called recurrences and in some people they don't happen very frequently and in others they happen about four to five times per year. Um, so there really is no cure for herpes simplex virus type 2. Once you got it, you got it and it's because it's able to go dormant in your sensory neurons and kind of hang out there indefinitely. But there are a couple of drugs that are used to uh, treat the symptoms of these types of outbreaks. One is called acyclovir, or it goes under the trade name Zovirax, and then the other is valacyclovir, which undergoes, uh, which goes by the trade name Valtrex. So be careful, a lot of people have herpes simplex virus type 2 out there in the population. Uh, other strains of herpes virus cause fever blisters you know, that's oral herpes virus infection. And uh, yes, some strains of these viruses, though, are able to be transmitted from one location to the other. So another reason to, to be careful. All right, so a little bit about HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, which can progress to AIDS, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And um, about 1.2 million people in the United States are infected with HIV. Many of them are being treated. We do have uh, drugs that keep the virus suppressed or under control so that they generally don't progress to AIDS, full-blown AIDS, in most cases. But those people are still infectious. They are capable of transmitting the virus to their sexual partner, so they have to be very careful. And kind of a scary stat is about 20% out of those 1.2 million believed to be infected in the United States don't know they have it. And the reason for that is there's a very long incubation period for this virus where you don't have symptoms. That means the virus is inside you, it's multiplying, but you don't know you have it. That's called the incubation period. You don't really have any symptoms. Yes, it can be detected through clinical testing, um, an HIV test, but you don't know you have it. 
what this virus does is it actually infects your T cells, T lymphocytes, macrophages, and then microglia in your central nervous system. And um, it takes a long time for the virus to spread enough to wipe these cells out, especially these T cells, these T lymphocytes. Um, but eventually you reach a point where it has wiped out, if untreated, you reach a point where it has wiped out so many of those T cells. The T cells are, are like the grand conductors of your adaptive immune system, um, the branch that makes antibodies and generates cytotoxic T cells that hunt down cells in your body that have uh, viruses and bacteria inside them. And so once those are gone, your adaptive branch of your immune system just collapses and uh, that's when you progress to AIDS. So when you have AIDS, you're not able to fight off very many of the microbes that you get exposed to. And uh, you wind up with um, many, many, many different types of infections, many of which just don't occur um, in people other than those who have some sort of immunodeficiency deficient immune system. Um, in fact, a couple of in fact, uh, a couple of conditions shown here almost only occur in AIDS patients, and they're kind of diagnostic. If you see a patient with these, uh, they almost certainly are infected with HIV and have AIDS. One of those are these skin lesions, which are called uh, Kaposi sarcoma, which are a type of skin cancer. And uh, your immune system is programmed to fight off, you know, many types of cancers. And if your immune system collapses, this is a type of skin cancer that you're, you're prone to develop. And again, you pretty much only see these and this occur in AIDS patients and uh, not in people with normal functioning immune systems. And then another is a type of pneumonia um, caused by an organism called pneumocystis. Um, very common out in the environment. We all get exposed to it. Um, does not cause pneumonia if you have a normal functioning immune system, but if you have AIDS, your immune system has collapsed, you're going to get this type of pneumonia. And so that's a, another one of those types of infections that's kind of diagnostic for AIDS. Luckily, HIV is kind of a wimp, so it doesn't hang around out in the environment. People aren't going to sneeze it out. It doesn't, um, you know, it's not released through your respiratory fluids. Um, once it's out in the environment, it doesn't last for very long. It falls apart pretty quickly. Most common disinfectants will inactivate it pretty quickly, which is a great thing. Um, pretty much, you got to have blood-blood contact um, or sexual fluid contact in order for transmission to take place. Um, Secretions of the reproductive tract have T cells in them and macrophages in them that if you're infected with HIV will have the virus inside those types of cells. So that's often how it winds up being transmitted sexually. Uh, the good news, you guys working as healthcare workers, clinical transmissions are extremely rare. Uh, HIV has been known for about 30 years and um, the last statistic I saw was been maybe 200 cases of HIV being transmitted from patients to healthcare workers through needle sticks. You still have to be extremely careful, but just keep in mind that um, it's very unlikely you're going to contract a, uh, HIV by working with HIV-infected patients. All right, uh, chlamydia, um, sometimes known as the CLAP. This is a very common bacterial infection is caused by an organism um, whose scientific name is chlamydia trachomatis. This is kind of a scary statistic though. About 4% of, of young people are infected with this bacterium at any given time. Um, and a lot of times they don't know they have it. So a lot of cases are asymptomatic. So you may be infected with this organism and you're spreading it around to sexual partners and you don't know it's there. Um, but in other people they will have a a discharge, a pus-filled discharge, painful urination. Some of the symptoms are similar to those of gonorrhea. In males, um, males will have inflammation along the urethra. Um, in some cases, though, you got to be careful because the bacteria can spread through the urethra 
into the vas deferens and they can actually get down here in the epididymis on the posterior side of uh, the, your two testes and once they're in there you have a condition called epididymitis inflammation of the epididymis uh, which is not too cool and it can lead to sterility so if you got a lot of inflammation going on in here sperm cells produced in the testes are probably not going to make it into your vas deferens too well there's the dogs barking again um, in females Females have to be careful because um, the bacteria can get into the cervix and cause cervicitis, and you can have a discharge due to that. Um, but a big problem in females is if the bacteria get in here along the endometrium, and then they can spread into the fallopian tubes, and you can have inflammation along the, um, the mucous membrane lining of the fallopian tubes. And uh, that's a progression to what's called PID or pelvic inflammatory disease when you have infection in the uterus and on into the fallopian tubes and that can be extremely serious it can uh, lead to things like sterility and even ectopic pregnancies due to the scar tissue formation that occurs when those infections develop uh, this can be treated pretty easily there's an antibiotic called azithromycin that's most commonly prescribed for chlamydia infections. All right, what about gonorrhea? Gonorrhea is also caused by a type of bacterium Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, in males, you know, some of the symptoms are, are somewhat similar to chlamydia, but uh, more people have symptoms when they're infected with gonorrhea than, than when they're infected with chlamydia. So I think more, more people know that they have this. Although not everyone, it can be asymptomatic um, in some people. So they don't know they have it, but they can certainly spread it to others. Uh, in males, inflammation of the urethra, painful urination due to that inflammation, and you can have a yellowish discharge due to the, the pus and the, the fluids that are being secreted around the, the locations where inflammation is occurring. So that sounds really, really pleasant. In females, it'll infect the urethra and the reproductive tract. So it will move along the mucosal membrane lining of the vagina, and it can move into the cervix. So you can have a discharge from the cervix, which is shown here in, in this diagram. Uh, infection with Neisseria gonorrhea can also progress to PID, just like infection with chlamydia. So you have to be careful about that. And um, you know, this diagram is actually showing, here's a, oops, skipped over, here's a blow up of a fallopian tube, and they're showing you, you, know, you can actually have a, a wad of these bacteria uh, growing inside the fallopian tubes. And, um, you know, even if your immune system clears the infection and it goes away, you can have scar tissue, inappropriate connective tissue that forms there along the inside lining of the fallopian tubes that can lead to sterility because if your little secondary oocytes can't progress through there um, that can cause sterility it can also cause inappropriate attachment of fertilized oocytes along the inside lining of the fallopian tubes and that's an ectopic or a tubal pregnancy so that your risk for that actually goes up if you've had pelvic inflammatory disease this is also um, the main reason why newborns, their eyes are treated with uh, antibiotic ointments or drops right after birth. It's to try to prevent infections of newborn eyes with Neisseria gonorrhea. This can be treated with antibiotics. So if, you, uh, if it's caught in time, you'll take drugs and it will go away. Unfortunately, though, um, there are many strains of Neisseria gonorrhea are becoming resistant to the antibiotics that we have traditionally used. Okay, let's move on to another pleasant sexually transmitted infection, genital warts. These are caused by HPV, which stands for human papillomavirus. Okay, so this is, this is, this is a virus, so it actually goes inside your skin cells or the cells along the mucous membrane linings um, of the urethra and um, 
also in the female reproductive organs. And what this virus does, if you look at this figure over here, here's the virus. It goes into these cells, um, typically skin cells or mucous membrane, um, cells of mucous membrane linings. And once it goes inside these cells, it replicates, it multiplies itself, and it also has this annoying um, property that it stimulates these cells to divide in, an un, in a fairly uncontrolled manner. Now, your immune system will keep it under control, but you will nevertheless have um, overgrowing skin cells or cells from those mucous membrane linings. That overgrowth of cells is what we call a wart. Um, and almost all warts are caused by human papillomaviruses. So even if you have uh, a wart on your skin, that's what's happening. There are just are different strains that tend to uh, invade or infect the tissues around the genital region versus um, other parts, skin around other parts of the body. Here's a, a really pleasant picture of what a genital wart may look like. Now they can be really small. You may not even know that they're there. Um, it's not unusual, especially for males, maybe to not know that they have them. And um, they can be fairly painless. In other cases, though, they can be very large and very dramatic. So you may not even know that you have genital warts because these little overgrowths are so small or they're, they're not noticeable. But um, if you really want to freak yourself out, go to Google Images and type in um, HPV warts. And um, you'll see some very shocking and interesting images if you just feel like entertaining yourself. Big problem with uh, hepatitis, not hepatitis, human papillomavirus, though, is that so you have this overgrowth of cells. And you guys know that cancers are cells usually from epithelial tissues that overgrow and take on the property of being able to spread to other parts of your body um, and that's when they have become cancerous so unfortunately HPV is capable of at times triggering these epithelial type cells to become cancerous and you guys know that already in females uh, cervical cancer is a big time problem with a uh, genital HPV infection in females. Most cases of cervical cancer are thought to be caused by human papillomaviruses. But uh, HPV also can trigger penile and anal cancers in males and mouth and throat cancers in both. And these are thought to be triggered through uh, the virus spreading by oral sexual activity. So more pleasant things to, to think about. It is incurable. So yes, your immune system may get rid of it, or it may not. So, um, but we don't currently have a cure. We do have vaccines available for HPV. Gardasil and Cervarex are the, the two that are available. And you've probably heard of Gardasil, because Gardasil, there was some controversy about that for a while, about how some people thought if they had their young teenage girls vaccinated um, for, to help prevent human papillomavirus infection that might provide them with some license to be sexually promiscuous. And, um, you know, hopefully people are changing their thought. I'm not going to get on a soapbox, but hopefully people are changing their thought processes away from that now because certainly those vaccines yes they can protect you against human papillomavirus infection they don't protect you from any other type of sexually transmitted disease it's just this particular virus and uh, so hopefully with good education um, teenagers won't think just because they receive this vaccination that they have a free license to go out and have unprotected sex with lots of sexual partners Another thing to, to think about as well is, you know, our kids can go to their wedding nights lily white and pure, and you don't know about their spouses they're marrying, though. And a lot of times, both males and females may have been infected with human papillom papillomavirus and not know that they have it and transmit it to others. So that's just something to think about as well. And the benefits of these vaccines in um, preventing 
cervical cancer, I think, far outweigh any risk that your kid's going to become sexually promiscuous because they thought they received a vaccine that gives them free license to go out and do whatever they want to. All right, enough soapboxing. Um, how about syphilis? Syphilis is another bacterial infection. This is caused by treponema pallidum. And um, there aren't nearly as many cases of, of uh, treponema pallidum infection as the other ones that we've talked about. Um, about 14,000 are diagnosed in the United States each year. But if this is undiagnosed, it can be pretty dramatic. It goes through three phases. Uh, the first phase is called primary syphilis. That can progress if untreated to secondary syphilis, which that can progress if it's never caught, never treated, decades down the road to the third stage or tertiary syphilis. And um, that's not very common anymore in the United States because we know about it and have this infection treated. It's treatable with good old fashioned penicillin that still takes care of treponema pallidum. So uh, you're really only going to see these later stages if people have never been treated. Now sometimes, um, especially in females, females may miss the primary syphilis stage because where the bacteria actually enter the body, um, you develop um, a sore or a lesion that's called a chancre and it can be hard in consistency and painless. Now the guys are probably going to know that they have it, but apparently, you know, with females not having quite as much of an open view of their uh, external reproductive anatomy, they might miss that they have a chancre. Shank now this heals in about three to six weeks, but that initial infection is called uh, primary syphilis. So if you know about it, you get you take penicillin. Penicillin does a good number on the bacteria and they go away. Um, if untreated, though, the bacteria enter your cardiovascular system. They get into the blood, they get into the lymphatic system, and they spread throughout the body. And that can progress to what's called secondary syphilis. So you have the bacteria all throughout the body, high fever, malaise, you feel very tired, your lymph nodes are swollen, um, you can develop skin rashes, your hair can start to fall out. So uh, pretty nasty stuff if it progresses to that level. Then your immune system generally kind of wipes most of the bacteria out, but some of them survive and go dormant in the body for very long periods of time. And that can progress though, you know, 10, 20, 30 years down the road, you can develop what's called tertiary syphilis or the third level of syphilis. And uh, this is where maybe you've heard before that uh, People with syphilis can go blind and can go crazy. Uh, those are symptoms associated with this third stage, tertiary syphilis. And they also get really nasty, uh, gooey tumors called um, guma tumors located on the skin or even located on internal organs. So tertiary syphilis is pretty nasty stuff. And thankfully, we don't have very many cases of that in the United States anymore, but you may encounter patients during your careers who do have that third stage of syphilis. Um, okay, trichomoniasis, um, otherwise known as trick. This is very common, over 7 million cases of this in the United States each year, and this is actually caused by a protozoan, trichomonas vaginalis, which this is a, an image I found on the internet. Um, with some 3D representations of these trichomonas organisms that uh, they live along the mucous membrane linings of the uh, reproductive tracts in males and females. And um, now males a lot of times, well really males and females, it can be asymptomatic, no symptoms. So about 50% of males and females who have this organism living along their reproductive tract linings don't really know that it's there. Um, in fact, so many people have it and it doesn't cause symptoms in so many people that it's almost kind of considered part of your, uh, for many people, it's just kind of part of their normal microbes that live on and inside of their bodies. Um, but then when it does get spread to other people, 
who don't already have it. It can cause vaginitis in females, so inflammation along the vaginal lining, um, which can lead to a white to green frothy discharge. Isn't that pleasant? Um, another bad thing is when you, anything really that causes inflammation along the vaginal lining in females increases your risk for infection with HIV. And uh, the reason for that is any sort of irritation along the vaginal lining, if you do have sexual contact with a partner who transmits HIV to you, it's more likely that that virus is going to move through the tissues along the mucosal lining of the vagina into the underlying tissues and get into your bloodstream if you have any sort of irritation, inflammation going on along the vaginal lining. So that's, that's a bad thing about trichomoniasis and really these other STIs that we've talked about that, that can cause inflammation along the vaginal lining. All of those things really increase risk of HIV transmission from males to females. Also, if you're pregnant and you become infected with this organism, you're more likely to go into premature labor. Something else to keep in mind. Males really don't have symptoms very often, so they're spreading it around to their female partners. It's usually the females who deal with the more severe symptoms uh, with this particular organism. Um, Here's a chart up here, though, that shows overall prevalence. This is how many people at any given time in the United States are infected with trichomonas. So among women ages 14 to 49 across the whole country, about 3.1%. Um, about 4.8% of women who go into college health clinics at any given time have trichomonas living um, in their reproductive tracts. Look at adolescent females, the 13.8%. Women who go to STD clinics, 18.5%, 13.1% of males. So this is pretty widespread out there in the population. We do have good drugs to treat it, though. Metronidazole or um, tinidazole, both of those are uh, medications that are effective against this organism. So if you have it, you can get rid of it. Now, as far as preventing these STIs, most of it's just common sense. These are things that uh, we hear about all the time. Um, obviously, abstinence is going to be your number one prevention method. And obviously, you guys, these things overlap with preventing pregnancies, contraception. Know your partners. Um, know some of the symptoms of these different sexually transmitted diseases. So, you know, know what a genital wart looks like, know what herpes virus lesions look like. Uh, use condoms, male and female condoms. Both of these can prevent transmission of these uh, organisms that cause STIs. They're not prevented by birth control pills. I know Dr. Mashburn had that in her video lecture as well. Birth control pills do absolutely nothing to prevent uh, the spread of sexually transmitted disease-causing organisms. And as I mentioned, the Gardasil vaccine against human papillomavirus, it only protects uh, females, and now males are also beginning to receive the vaccination, only protects against these viruses that cause genital warts, which can down the road trigger uh, various types of cancer, especially cervical cancer. They don't provide any protection against any other sexually transmitted diseases. And um, you know, do be aware that there are other things as well that are transmitted sexually that we haven't talked about, such as uh, various um, hepatitis viruses are transmitted through sexual activity as well, hepatitis B virus. So there, um, you know, sexual transmission is a pretty common mode for spreading infections around from person to person. All right, I'm going to conclude that there. Uh, thank you very much, and let me know if you have any questions about these very pleasant sexually transmitted infections that we've talked about. Thank you.